There we go. That's the official start. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, how our memorials equitably funded uh, the third in the series of conversations on public memorials and monuments hosted by uh, the Goethe Institute of Boston and as well as now and there. Um, I'm Leah Triplett Harrington. I use the she, her pronoun series. I'm the curator here at Now and There, and I'm super excited for this conversation. Um, thank you all for joining us um, during your lunchtime or evening hours, depending on where you are in the world. Um, I want to acknowledge first that Now and There and the Goethe Institute of Boston are on the unceded land of the Massachusetts people. We acknowledge the Massachusetts people past, present, and future. Um, and our projects and related events must acknowledge that it was founded, um, that our, our lands are founded um, on the, upon the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous people. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm really excited to spend this time with you all and continue our conversation on the multifaceted and ever evolving role of monuments in public space. Um, this is the third of our conversations. I think we're going to link to some of the recordings um, so you can check out the, the first two. Um, but we're bringing Boston local and German global perspectives together um, as now and there prepares to mount summer sets, uh, which is an installation by Juana Bondo asking us to reimagine our role in the construction of collective public spaces um, by inter intervening on the monument um, to Sam Adams in Dock Square near Faneuil Hall. Um, so these conversations have been really fascinating and helpful as we kind of contextualize how we as a, has, we as a society and we as a region understand um, public symbols in our, in our public spaces. If you don't know, um, Now and There is dedicated to temporary and site-specific public artworks uh, like summer sets that open up public spaces uh, for contemporary art and dialogue, um, therefore, therefore reimagining what spaces could be. Uh, we don't commission public, uh, I'm sorry, we don't commission permanent work. Uh, we are temporary and site-specific, hence our name. Uh, but our friends and colleagues at the Boston Art Commission shepherd those projects into being. And if you're curious about um, some of those permanent permanent uh, monuments and memorials, please check out their meetings, which are open to the public and on Zoom um, the second Tuesday of every month from 4.30 to 6. We'll be jump, uh, dropping that link into the chat as well. Um, those are fantastic ways to get up to speed on, on what's happening around um, permanent memorial making in Boston um, and to actually participate in it. So they do take public commentary and that's the way that you can do that. Um, there's a lot going on. Uh, there's a lot to catch up on um, if you're interested. Um, some of you in Boston might be familiar with the, the King Memorial to Martin Luther and Coretta Scott King, uh, which had their groundbreaking a couple months ago. That's funded through a private and public partnership. Um, and you can get updates on where that project is at those meetings. There's the Justice Edward o. Gordon Veterans Memorial in um, Nubian Square, um, which is uh, created by Faye Cunningham, amazing Boston artist who recently passed away. You can also get updates there um, see, and see the many, many projects um, that are coming to life. So thinking carefully about money and funding is integral um, to reimagination. Um, our conversation today is very much focused on the future um, of funding and you will use two funding structures as examples of, of new and more equitable ways to support public art and communities. Um, I'm really excited for them to talk to us about strategies that they've implemented um, to that end, as well as barriers they've faced along the way and how they've overcome them. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Annette, uh, at the Goethe Institute, who will introduce um, our moderator and take us into the rest of the program. Yeah, thanks, Leah. Um, and hello to you all. Um, thanks for joining us um, here and on the other side of the Atlantic. My name is Annette Klein, as Leah said, and I'm program curator here at the Goethe Institute in Boston. And I'm really thrilled to welcome you to this third conversation in our panel series um, with Now and There. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Goethe Institute is the cultural institute of the German Federal Republic. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization um, in Germany and is dedicated to fostering international cultural dialogue between Germany and Europe and the rest of the world, which in our case here in Boston means New England. Um, and we're really excited about this conversation today. Um, we're expecting to learn as much as all of you um, from our panelists um, about connecting the dots between artists and communities and funding sources. Um, 
Germany is, of course, known for its robust support for the arts. Um, and with a quick search yesterday, I calculated that on the federal level, Germany um, supports the arts and culture with about 50 times more per person than in the US. And if you go down to the state and communal levels, um, that's where Germany actually supports a lot more heavily. So there is a lot of support there, but as government funding has it, um, there's a lot of bureaucracy, there are hoops to jump through, a lot of politics involved often, and, um, and in, the, in the end, top-down decisions. And so there is a need um, to navigate, to, to try to figure out um, alternate ways of um, funding projects. Um, and it often, this kind of funding doesn't necessarily reach the communities and the artists equitably. So we're really looking forward to hearing from um, Katrin Jenkins and Abigail Santinsky about their work and their organization's work um, and their initiatives, which are, I think, trying to fill some of the gaps in their respective um, traditional commis commissioning and, and funding systems. And it will be really interesting to see um, what challenges they face, um, what initiatives they have uh, taken and, and also where we can learn from each other. Um, so we can't think of a better partner to do this with, with than now and there. This has been a really great um, series of panels and uh, we really um, are, are, admire um, now and there and their work that they're doing in Boston with uh, as well, connecting artists and communities and um, creating dialogue around really important topics in the public space. And we're really looking forward to Somersets with Juan Hobando uh, coming up in July. Um, so I'd like to start things off and introduce Devin uh, Morris, who is uh, our moderator in chief. He's been moderating these discussions since the beginning and doing a fantastic job um, asking a lot of really tough questions and uh, taking us through these panels. Um, Devin is the co-founder and executive director of the Teachers Lounge, which was founded in 2018. The Teachers Lounge is dedicated to creating and curating spaces intended to increase the recruitment, revitalization, and retention of educators of color around the greater Boston area. And Devin is uh, clearly very passionate about community engagement, equity, uh, education, and has used this passion to um, work with schools and uh, around Boston and New York City as a teacher and mentor, and uh, is also sitting on several local and national coalitions supporting the diversification of the teacher work phase, workforce. Sorry. Um, so with that, I'd like to, uh, I hope you all enjoyed this conversation. I'd like to pass it on to Devin, and I hope that you will participate with uh, comments and questions in the chat function. Um, and on to you, Devin. Thanks, Annette. Um, welcome all. Um, good afternoon to those of you uh, stateside, and good evening to those of you uh, abroad. Um, as noted, my name is Devin Morris. I'm, uh, in addition to my uh, newly added title of moderator in chief, which Annette, I'll be adding to my to my resume. Thank you for that. Um, I am the co-founder and executive director of the Teachers Lounge. Uh, Leah, thanks for adding in the chat uh, a link to our website. And you know, please please take a look and and reach out if you have questions. But I'm um. In my role as moderator in chief, I'm, I'm so thrilled to be here with you all in part three of this discussion series. Um, so thanks to those who have joined for our previous conversations. Um, thank you to the Goethe Institute and the Now and Their team for having me back. Um, and before we dive in today, I just thought it was important to do a quick look back at where we've been. And so we've uh, explored some incredible topics in the past two sessions to cover in session one, what makes a monument? as an exploration of uh, moments, movements, and monuments. And in session two, we asked the question of what role do artists play in reimagining the construction of our public spaces? Um, and this was an exploration of how artists can intervene with monuments and create new modes of commemoration and community. And a common theme that surfaced in both of those discussions was about as we see a call for new monuments and memorials, 
um, and more democratic and inclusive design processes, how are we also seeing funding structures shifting to make the vision for these new spaces into a reality? And so we're really excited to dive into this topic and more in today's discussion, discussion with our two incredible guests with us today, Catherine and Abigail. And so Abby, I'm gonna kick things off with you. And so first of all, thank you for, for being here with us. Um, and I was hoping you could start us off by just telling us a little bit about yourself and your work with Tufts Art Galleries and Collective Futures, uh, Collective Futures Fund. Sure. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. Um, oh, it's not right. You slideshow. Does that look good? Yes. Okay. Hi. Hi, everybody. My name is Abby Satinsky. Um, so I just want to start by saying that it's an honor to be joining you all from Texas um, as a guest on the lands of, of the Coyotecan and the ancestral lands of my husband and son and extended family, whereas normally I am a guest on Massachusetts, as well as Nipmuc and Wampanoag lands. I'm grateful to our hosts for their caretaking of these lands since time immemorial and recognize that my presence there is part of a settler colonial legacy that also includes the university and surrounding institutions. My gratitude extends to the land, waters, and other than human kin who call these lands home. May this gratitude be followed in our work by good thought, good action, and good relation. May we also acknowledge the enslaved, marginalized, colonized, and oppressed people who have moved through and lived on the lands on which we make public art and monuments. All monuments are produced on stolen land. So, um, so I'm here in my role as the program director um, for the Collective Futures Fund. Um, I'm also the curator and head of public engagement for the Tufts University Art Galleries. And I just wanted to start off um, by giving some thoughts on like some things I'm working through right now um, in my role as a funder. And then I'll explain a little bit about the Collective Futures Fund and what we do. So the first tenant that I've been thinking about is that the redistribution of resources for a more equitable and just world is a creative process. Um, redistribution of resources should be the goal and that by being creative, we are also being responsive to how artist practices are evolving and need to evolve to meet our changing social conditions. The second is that everyone deserves to see themselves represented in public space um, and not necessarily by monuments, but by their full lives and welcomed and made safe in public space. It is then that we can make new imaginaries come into being. Um, and so these are some of the things that I've been thinking about um, in relationship to that. So, um, so one is thinking about a trust-based funding model where artists and invested community members are the sources of local knowledge. Um, and so, you know, really investing in that kind of trust and understanding um, that the speed will happen when trust is established. And so then into time. So, you know, when we're funding, we need to be funding long-term commitments um, past traditional short-term uh, funding cycles and measurable impact, um, meaning that uh, projects that are based in relation, they take a long time and we can't always see what the end will be. And so if we put really short timelines where then we measure what the artist is supposed to have accomplished and the community relations that were supposed to be produced, then we're being short-sighted about the possibilities of making public art. Um, and this is a quote that I think um, a lot uh, about, which is from the performance scholar, Diana Taylor, who says, the search for justice is a long durational performance. Although, and I'm sorry, but let me see if I can get this to, no. Uh, let's see, there we go. Although the, ta I just couldn't see my own quote. Although the tactics and circumstances change over time, it's the endurance and perseverance that prove efficacious. And then lastly, we should be thinking about um, permission and an expanded notion of, of what permission is um, when we are thinking about making monuments and memorials. So um, seek permission and build relationships with the land and the waterways, indigenous peoples who continue to steward that place, as well as the communities of that place who have been dispossessed or forcibly removed, extracted from, from or otherwise marginalized. 
you know, again, this sort of statement, public art is made on stolen land. How do we move through that? How do we deeply acknowledge that? How do we see that as a practice that we continually center, you know, both in funding and, and making? Um, so this, and then I just wanted to share um, a little bit about where these thoughts for myself have come from and some of the practices that I bring um, to the Collective Futures Fund. So in Chicago in 2006, I started an artist run space um, called Incubate, where we thought about sustaining artists as a creative process. This was sort of our research space. It was a residency program. Um, and one of our projects was to start a micro grant to fund artist projects that fell outside of traditional funding categories um, and to initiate a collective process of sharing the resources that were already present in our community. And we were building this off of many models that had come before. Um, and that meant opening up the grant um, process to others. So we made a meal, we invited the public to come, um, they paid five to $10 for the food, and then they got a vote in who received the pot of money at the end. Artists submitted grant proposals that were debate upon, debated upon during the meal, and then the vote took place and the money awarded. This was the first one that we did in 2007. This actually took us a number of weeks to make this $218. Um, so, and then what was interesting about this project, um, you know, this is in 2007, so this is before Kickstarter or, you know, kind of the crowdsource fundraising that we think about today, is that a lot of other people took this up independently from us and turned it into their own project. Um, and it created this incredible network. So these are some of the um, funding dinners that happen in different places. On the top is Providence Provisions. Uh, and the bottom left is Feast in New York. And on the bottom right is um, Philadelphia Steak. Um, at a certain point, um, I can't remember when, but there was, uh, you know, so we made resources as to how people could start these, you know, um, this kind of program. And at a certain point, there were 65 of them operating um, internationally. So it was this kind of incredible, you know, kind of community-based network that was based around a very simple idea that was built upon, you know, these um, other histories. Um, the other thing that just like came up for me recently when I was thinking about this panel in particular was this artist Damon Locks, um, who's based in Chicago. And um, he spoke recently at a, at, um, a symposium I went to called um, Last Gaspism, Art in the Age of the Pandemic. And um, and he said something that I've been turning over in my mind that I think is really relevant to this conversation. Um, he said, you know, when thinking about when monuments are coming down, he asked himself, where does the imaginary come um, from for a new form of monumentality? And specifically, what does a black monument look like? Um, and so he formed Black Monument Ensemble um, to think about a monument that's built on blackness, that's built on dance, that's built on rhythm and joy, and it's made through a kind of ensemble practice. Um, and so we should be thinking about meeting our moment through sociality and affirmations of community practice. So they have two albums, their music is incredible. I really would encourage everybody to check them out, but it just like, it was a symposium I went to a couple of weeks ago and it just like really hit me about like, just this new way of making monuments. This is them recording their second album during the pandemic. So, um, so yeah, so this is Collective Futures Fund. Um, we give out $80,000 a year in grant funding to collaborative community and public art projects led by visual artists, curators, and collectives across Norfolk, Su Suffolk, Essex, and Middlesex counties in greater Boston in amounts ranging from 2K to 6K. Um, so we offer funds for research, new projects, and ongoing platforms. And I'll say this again at the end, but our applications are due June 30th. So um, please, please join in. Um, so it's administered by the Tufts University Art Galleries. I'm an employee of Tufts University. Um, and we are part of a national network called the Regional Regranting Initiative of the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts. And the project is also supported in part um, by an anonymous donor. So. I hope that what we do is provide an incubator and support mechanism for independent artist run culture in greater Boston to continue to thrive. We fund artist run spaces, community events, um, alternative history projects, artist led education and more. And um, I'm just gonna share a couple examples of what we funded this last year. So this is Unadulterated Black Joy, a series of celebrations for black mothers by black mothers. They're doing an event 
tomorrow at Chez Vu. Um, so you should all sign up and join them for that. This is a project by artists Allison Crony Moses, Zahira Noor Truth, and Tanya Nixon Silberg. This is the AGX Film Collective, which is a long standing artist run film lab and collective for moving image artists in the Boston area. I think they're based in Waltham. Um, this is You Me We's Dystopian Revolutionary Gallery Pod by the artists um, Marlon Forrester and JPix Belmer, and with some support by Casey Curry, um, which is essentially a photography gallery that's integrated into seating um, platforms that we installed around Boston. This is Holding Space Archive. You can learn about all these. I'm just like gonna give you some examples as an overview, but you can go on our website and learn, um, learn more about these incredible projects. This is Holding Space, an online exhibition space and archive by chronically ill and disabled creators. It's a project by independent curator, Whitney Mashburn. Um, and then this is House of Threes, which is a queer collaborative space, safe space built by and for community to heal, nurture, and protect each other. And it's led by artist Poe Koto. So all these artists, you know, you can find them um, on our website or, you know, just by individually searching. Um, and, you know, they're all in a kind of state of becoming. When we fund folks, we ask them to begin their project. We don't ask them to end it. Um, so that's sort of part of our model. And I just wanted to end by saying um, the projects of Collective Futures Fund are held and led by specific groups of people to center their needs and experiences, but are also grounded in the spirit of generosity and publicness for others outside their community to learn from and support or to just leave alone. Um, a sociality out of which new forms of monumentality can emerge, because we know what public space looks and feels like when it's driven by the interests of corporate and real estate greed and white supremacy, and it is not serving any of us in the social emergency that we're living in. So thank you. There's also an info session tomorrow at 6 p.m. So um, please check out our website and thank you so much for having me. Abby, thank you so much. Um, that was, I, I really appreciated hearing the um, sort of grassroots history of how you came into the work personally, but then how it's evolved into sort of what you are um, so passionate about now and how the evolution into, like before we even talk about this evolution of into more traditional philanthropic dollars, sort of funding initiatives, that there was a community first um, that, that got sort of local artists off the ground and, and got them sort of what they needed from $218 now to $2,000 and $6,000 increments is, is a really great, great journey. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I'm looking forward to coming back to this topic in a bit as it, as it ties into um, what Katrin will be talking about and then the, 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 the theme overall. Um, so Katrin, let's, let's, let's turn things over to you. Thank you for being here. Um, today and would love to hear about a little bit about you and about your work with with new patrons. Yeah, oh, thank you. Sorry, Katherine, one thing. Sorry, 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 sorry. I just want to make this this note to everyone. Um, one, so I'm so it's not just uh, me, Kenny and Leah in the chat. Um, I'm a, a former school teacher. I, I operate very much on a sort of call and response. And so um, I just wanted to say, Abby, you, you dropped a couple of gems that, gems that resonated with me. And so if you see me popping something in the, in the chat, it's just something that I want to hold on to that someone has said. And so you, you all should make use of the chat as well, um, our, our uh, guests. If there's something that resonates with you, if there's something that you hear that you want to come back to, please make use of the chat um, in, that, in that way. Okay. Sorry to interrupt, Katani. I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this wonderful panel series. Um, I'm uh, so happy to have the opportunity to yeah, present uh, um, our initiative, our network, and uh, also yeah, start an exchange about the possibility to fund these kind of uh, uh, new monuments or uh, uh, monuments that are maybe um, yeah, not these kind of classical monuments we are thinking about. Um, I would also like to uh, show an example. So I'm sharing my screen, um, just a second. Mm. 
I hope you can see it. Yeah, I hope you can uh, see the screen, the presentation. Um, I'm actually working in Germany. Um, hello from Dusseldorf, from the Rhineland in West Germany. And um, I'm working there as a uh, yeah, freelance mediator for the initiative, the European network um, called New Patrons, Neue Auftraggeber, we call it in Germany. And um, yeah, I would uh, maybe um, firstly like to explain the way we are working because I found it very interesting uh, what uh, you just described, Abby, about these three different aspects of funding, because this is something that we are also in our process based, we're very much uh, thinking and working with. And uh, therefore, I really also would like to first uh, shortly describe our methodology of working and then show an example and how we try to find the money for these type of projects. Um, yeah, um, the idea of new patrons actually is to enable civic groups to commission public works on their own initiative accompanied by professional cultural mediators like, uh, like I'm working as a mediator. So, um, of course, artists have always worked on commissions, but commissions are mostly connected to juries and the privilege of affording the work of art. And the idea of um, the bottom-up initiative, New Patrons, actually is to empower people to become commissioners and to give their concerns a voice and a form. So the initiative started in France, actually, in the early 90s as Nouveau Commanditaire with the help of the Fondation de France, like the largest philanthropic network in France. And um, yeah, and as you can see on the map, it was formed over time also in other European countries like Belgium, Spain, Italy, Greece, Switzerland and beyond. And we are uh, in exchange as a European network and um, in yeah, most of the project until now, projects until now were realized in France, but in Germany, we are uh, for the last year working in four different land and re industrial regions in East and West Germany's, Germany on about around 15 projects, um, working with commissioner groups from different generation and also from yeah, rural as well as urban contexts and with artists like Antje Majewski, Ruth Buchanan, Daniel Knorr, Jakub Szczesny, Lokovo, Kerstin Bredsch, Sascha Walz. Um, and I'm just working as a mediator um, with local groups in the Rhineland, uh, especially in a city called Mönchengladbach. You can see uh, yeah, examples of uh, our so-called first phase when the exchange between the commissioners and the artists starts. The first French mediators started their exchange with local group in South of France, in Burgundy, and thereby already following a kind of manifest which has been conceived by the artist François Ayres in 1990. And this, we call it the protocol, is still our DNA and describes the different roles of actors in the process. Um, the protocol has a decidedly social political ambition. It's promoting outreach in contemporary art. And um, yeah, the debates conducted in the early 90s about questions of globalization, institutional critique, relationality, context, sensitivity were very important sources, as well as uh, French social philosophy uh, by, for example, Bruno Latour. So what um, I find really still remarkable about this kind of um, methodology is the reversal of the classical production process. So it's the citizenry is not assigned the role of the participating audience that receives or interacts with an artwork, um, but brings and initiates and accompanies the process from the very beginning. Um, instead, the artist is invited to artistically interpret um, the given theme, the question, or an event or spatial situation with his kind of external perspective. So in the beginning, it is not clear what kind of 
uh, yeah, form, artistic form or artistic project will come out of it. So this is also referring to what uh, you were saying, Maggie. Um, the practice of a mediator actually focuses on the promotion of agency. So knowing both perspectives of commissioners and artists and the context, the mediator organizes the cooperation of the often very different actors and gradually involves together with the commissioners through the public administration and funding bodies. I would like to give one example um, from a project I'm working on for the last years in München Gladbach. And this is um, this project is not the production of a classical monument, as we are not memorizing a person or an event, but rather creating a third space, which is accessible and shall be used in the end. And at the same time, um, as you already have discussed also before in, uh, in the panel series, memorial culture, of course, is an important issue in Germany, as you all know. And in this context, the project I would like to talk about is also an intervention in an existing historic complex site. Mm, the city of München Gladbach uh, has about 260,000 inhabitants and lies close to the Dutch border. Um, the city, uh, city's industrial ascent was mainly influenced by the development of the textile industry from the mid 19th century to the mid 20th century. And after the Second World War, a major structural change began reducing the importance of the textile industry and establishing new economic and educational state sectors. Still, the city faces a high unemployment rate. And the Association for Unemployed People, the Community Center for Unemployed People in München Gladbach, there is offering meals and advice for already 40 years now and is linked to local tradition of workers' welfare. It is located in the city center in close neighborhood to the main important cultural and educational institutions. So the inner city of München Gladbach has many public functions and for the last years, is also undergoing a process of urban development. But at the same time, it is fragmentary as a public social space. The community center is, as you see, housed in a building from the 30s, which has been the former home of the Hitler youth. So it is a dense and historically complex site through the particular history called up by the fascist architecture, as well as the dramatic industrial um, work history of the city. The community center has approached new patrons in 2018 with the search for an exchange about ideas on how bridges can be built between the different audience of the institutions and inhabitants. So we somehow organized a kind of first round table and a close dialogue developed between two neighbors, the traditional humanist gymnasium, the high school and the unemployment center with very different audience actually. So the unemployed, of course, are always seen solely as passive recipients of uh, benefits and the students of the high school with an excellent profile on the other hand, uh, seen from this perspective as the future of the city. But of course, they hardly um, uh, meet, uh, although they're neighbors. So how they can learn from different perspectives became the initial question actually of our dialogue. And the commissioner group then started to be scholars of the school and visitors of uh, the unemployment center and their teams. Um, as you can see, the unemployment center has this large garden directly adjacent to the inner city park and the students of the high school and the users of the unemployment center decided that they want to heighten awareness of the social city context with using and hosting the garden in cooperation and opening it up to the city actually. Um, here you can see um, this type of commission that we are always formulating together with the commissioners as a kind of uh, first uh, public statement also. And um, I then proposed uh, the Berlin-based New Zealander Ruth Buchanan um, to work together with um, the group. So um, we are not working with a competition here. 
but uh, we invited her to come to Mönchengladbach and she, uh, in her work, she investigates how architecture and space affect the body movement, interaction and self-perception and examines power structures underlying spatial encounters. So this was somehow um, the reason why we invited her on this Buchanan immediately um, understood after talking to the group that it was all about relationships, relationships between our physical bodies, our place of dwelling, our place of work, uh, our sense of value in society. So she wanted to highlight, it, highlight these relationship. And what we, or what she actually proposed was a kind of twofold design, which started with um, garden film dance workshops in order to develop relationships and exchange. And uh, she further developed a special design that comprises, um, so here you can see also some of the dance and film workshops touching issues of work, labor, and uh, the relationship of healthiness and um, um, unemployment. So, um, so in the special design for the garden, she then uh, proposed um, a work that she titled The Garden with Bridges. After studying also the context of the site, she, um, she foresaw architectural interventions that provide new access to the site, a bridge, a ramp, a staircase, and a pavilion that creates a kind of sensation of arrival and uh, stress this type of togetherness in the space. And thereby she assigns a body part and a color to each of the architectural elements. So the tonk pink st spiral staircase is the throat and refers to the access to the inside of the body. And um, the pavilion with the kitchen is the stomach and burst the turquoise green of medicine as care and concern. And the purple ramp is seen as the backbone in the often used color of the international women's movement. It contrasts the history of the site as the former home of the Hitler use uh, with a feminist, with a clear feminist impulse. So this was the design that um, the artist uh, brought up. And this whole process actually, from the first research by me, the first contact with the commissioners and um, the design by the artist was funded by the Federal Cultural Foundation. The second phase, the project funding the realization is always um, then has to be found locally. So, um, together with the local group, with uh, institutional partners, um, uh, we are trying to, or we, we are planning to realize this uh, design this year, and um, thereby relied <clears throat> or are relying on this idea of an alliance of partners from the Ministry of Culture to the city, to social and art foundations, because it's entering different uh, fields and disciplines also, but also private engagement uh, in order also to heighten the identification. Important in this second phase of the project was the collaboration with our so-called anchor point in the region. Uh, in our region, it's the wonderful city museum at Thaiberg. And uh, already for several years, this museum is making an impact on the city with many projects in the midst of this structural change and brought in its institutional expertise also for the execution of the project. But um, yeah, but what I can say is that since 2017, the German Federal Cultural Foundation has been funding a five years pilot phase in Germany in order to, uh, with the aim to consolidate this kind of new patrons model, this kind of bottom up model in Germany and to integrate it in a network of European partnership. And so this was, I would say, very much relying on this idea of trust uh, to not knowing what kind of projects will come out of it. And uh, at the moment we are in a kind of transition phase. We just founded an association and want to exchange and broaden the expertise of mediation in this context. And uh, in this phase, we also got uh, funding also by the Federal Agency for Civic Engagement. Um, 
yeah, to establish the methodology of cultural participation through a mediation process in different regions throughout Germany, and thereby, of course, uh, acknowledging aspects of social, social solidarity, access to decision making, and mutual education. So, what, um, yeah, what I wanted to show um, re relating to this project is that all these projects we are working with. Um, no matter if it's temporary or permanent, they are in most cases long-term project and process-based projects. And uh, they are also kind of adventure because you never know in the beginning what will come out of uh, this discussion and uh, exchange uh, that is started. And um, also what I think uh, um, is important is um, in this part of the process to consider the different types of resources that people bring in in the process. If it's the local knowledge or the agency, the time or the engagement, the institutional expertise, these are all also resources that one would consider if one is uh, thinking about um, new forms of uh, funding processes. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Katrin. Um, can you stop sharing screen for just, there we go. So there's um, a lot to unpack here um, and lots of connections to the work that, that Abby is doing and, and, and has mentioned this, this concept of uh, reimagining spaces, um, the importance of stakeholder engagement and partnership and agency, uh, the importance in that process of, of relationships uh, being developed and making that vision into a reality. Uh, and, and you closed with, I really, really appreciated this sort of um, this factor of trust, which is slightly different than the way that, that, that um, Abby was, was speaking about it, but it is similar to the work that Abby was doing in terms of you both sort of uh, trusting a process, uncertain of what was actually going to come of your early, the early stages of your work. Um, as an experiment, but now it sounds like the work that you're doing, Katrin, has potential for expansion into other regions in Germany. Um, and so it's all really exciting. I'm going to break protocol just for a second here. Um, I know we said we were going to go into questions, but I do have a follow-up question for you that, um, that, that was not one of our sort of posed questions, but you mentioned this, this protocol, um, which, you know, uh, one of the factors talks about mediators establishing the connections between the work and the public as, as like, and I know it was excerpts, but, um, and then you also mentioned the commission as a, like that public statements, which I think is a really great example of transparency in the work that you all are doing. Can you just speak to how, how were those developed? Sort of, how, how did you come to the decision that those were going to be a part of your process? Um, and, and, and sort of how you determine that, um, that these were necessary. Yeah, I'm, I'm working for the initiative since late 2017, but the project already has a quite long history in France, actually. And the protocol was there from the beginning. So in 1990, um, there was a close exchange between the artist Francois Ayres and the Fondation de France. And the idea was also really to think about a kind of outreach and a kind of more social political um, ambition to also develop projects in rural area um, outside of Paris. And uh, so the protocol was there from the beginning. The first projects, as far as I know, started in 1992 in the south of France. And from the beginning, François Ayres tried to somehow formulate the way the different actors in the process would collaborate and how this kind of initiation process could be developed. And, um, and I also think that this idea of this common formulation of the commission is something that is practiced uh, widely throughout all the projects. And in Germany, we, we have done it for all the projects. And it's also, um, uh, as far as I learned, an interesting moment also to become conscious about the ambitions and to also formulate the ideas uh, or the questions that come up uh, for uh, the later discussion with the artist uh, who then comes in or the wider public also. Yeah. I love it. It changes also during the process. It's not sure. 
that this is like a given <laughs> a given task that always sure. stays. And and it's evolving. I like that it's evolving, but I also love that that um, for anyone new to the space, anyone who's looking for entry points, it gives clear guidelines around sort of the roles, as you named that that folks are playing, um, which is which is a form of access in times when when we talk about sometimes folks just don't know how to get involved. Folks don't know, um, you know, the roles that they can play. So I, I I just that stood out to me, and I just wanted to make sure that we had a clear sense of how, how that came to be. So thank you for that. Um, a quick note to our audience before we dive into these questions, just a reminder. So again, please make use of the chat function if you just have sort of comments or, or quotes that resonate, but make please make use of the um, Q&A feature if you have questions for our panelists. I'm gonna get us started with some questions of our own, but you should please, please, please make use of the, the Q&A feature in our uh, Now and There team. Um, will support get making sure that those questions get asked. And so um, question for you both is, um, how are you defining uh, patronage or funding in your own respective orgs? And, and Catherine, you, you talked a little bit at the end about um, the different resources that folks can bring to the space that sounds like beyond even just funding. And so we'd just love to hear how you all both are, are thinking about um, defining patronage and funding to to your respective orgs um i can start i guess um yeah i mean in in a certain way you know we're like a project that is based on sort of a national funding model um that is you know basically the warhol foundation partners with independent or you know local arts organizations as the kind of you know, in some ways, like a center of knowledge that then connects outward, and then we redistribute um, this funding. And so, you know, we do think about it pretty much in those traditional ways, in the sense that, you know, we're sort of getting this money out to our communities in the most equitable way that we see fit. And so we worked with them to, um, to think about how we could, you know, make this fit a Boston community in certain ways, and that was that we changed it into two tiers, um, that one would be for new projects and one would be um, for ongoing projects, because I think often, you know, there's this sort of scramble to make something for a new opportunity, but we also wanted to recognize that, um, that there is many people that are working in an ongoing way in the city and that we don't, that that's also where we want to be reaching. And then we also had an, um, an anonymous donor come forward that wanted to support another tier. So they support the sustaining practice, which is essentially for more emerging folks or people that are in a research and development phase um, so that they can have time to think through the ethos of what collective funds is and, um, and sort of move towards projects. Um, and so in that way, we're trying to like address, um, you know, a kind of larger ecosystem of support. Um, with the resources that we have, we don't like move into other kind of cohort learning or things that other um, folks do um, in certain kind of philanthropy, you know, settings. Um, but we really are trying to knit together a community to see themselves in relationship to each other because we are really funding like an artist run space to, you know, a more you know, a community event that they may use very different language to describe the work that they're doing, or they may really be reaching neighborhoods that, you know, aren't in, that don't, that are, you know, separated by many things. So we're trying to create a network of, you know, that artists can start to build something. Um, we are doing a um, collaboration with uh, Boston Art Review um, in the fall to make an issue that highlights the grantees as, as well as talk about funding support. So it's always about kind of like starting with the resource that we have and like building outward um, and building relationships there. Um, and then just one other resource I wanted to share, because I think it's like where I see a lot of really interesting thinking going in terms of funding is that um, uh, grant makers for the arts commissioned this new report on solidarity economies for artists. Um, and they have, I'll put it in the chat. Uh, it's called, it's, you can see it at art.coop. Um, and, and I think that's just like a really, ex I think that's what the website is. <laughs> I'll find it. But I think that's a really um, important way to think about how like funding 
um, can shift to thinking more about systems change and less about individual artists. And, you know, it really highlights this idea of um, self-determination and community wealth. And those are the kinds of things that are being invested in rather than particular projects. Um, and so, and it highlights among other things, the incredible work of Ujima Fund, who's based in Boston, you know, which is the first democratically managed investment fund in the country. It's led by BIPOC folks and um, working class folks to, you know, do non-extractive loans. It's like their thinking is so incredible. So, you know, I think we have the resources that we have at the, you know, Collective Futures Fund, and we're really always trying to imagine otherwise and imagine how artists are needing to be supported. And then we have incredible models that are here that are doing this work that we can, you know, build relationships to for the artists that we're working with, that they can, you know, that we can learn from them and that, you know, and that we can hopefully do the connecting that, you know, is possible. Thanks, Abby. Um... I want to hear more about the solidarity economies, um, but I like this concept of systems change in addition to supporting local and individual artists. Um, I want to come back to that as we talk about sort of how we're seeing things evolve um, in a bit. Um, but uh, Catherine, um, anything to add there? Yeah, in, in our case, the new patrons are not the persons who are bringing in the money, but the ideas, the questions, the, um, the local expertise um, or urgencies and are um, in most of the cases not coming out of the art field, but the artist is then stepping in later in the process. So um, it's very interesting to hear about this idea also to commonly decide on the spread of uh, uh, funds um, as uh, also in our case, it's, it's like a big uh, collaborative process. And also it's of course uh, relying on the idea that the artist is also part of this uh, process and uh, reflecting and uh, yeah, going together with this idea. So, in our projects, we are also noticing that we are not um, in the realization of the projects are not only looking for funds in the field of art, but also in different fields where these questions of solidarity and uh, the questions that you can find in rural areas, for example, uh, like about community engagement are very important. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. This this concept of sort of building out ecosystems um, that that um, you know that when when we talk about uh, monuments, when we talk about um, spaces that are impacting individual um, uh, areas, they're impacting communities, and that 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 means that that work spans beyond art. Um, itself and 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 so the concept of creating uh, ecosystems that span across different sectors, um, but also sort of um, thinking about systems change, I think is something that we're seeing a little bit more of, but would love to see more of. Um, and so, if you all, if you both could sort of speak to how you've seen the funding landscape evolve, if at all, um, but changing over the past few years. Would love to hear your take and um, there as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you know it was very instructive, or is very um, you know changed me in a lot of ways to get the opportunity to um, to within the galleries to make Collective Futures Fund happen, starting in a pandemic, um, and you know really thinking about the shifting terrain of what artists and communities need when we live in like a heightened state of uh, duress. And, um, and so the first thing that we did um, through the Warhol Foundation, they funded this, was to give us um, $60,000 to redistribute um, to Boston, Greater Boston artists um, in a lottery system with stated need. So anybody that said that they needed it um, could apply and then we gave $1,500 grants out. Um, the other thing is, you know, I used to work on a similar program in Chicago called the Propeller Fund. And I think 10, 15 years ago, like $6,000 was a meaningful impact um, and for a project. And now it's clear that $6,000 is just one small part of what is needed 
to yeah. produce this kind of work. And so I think really thinking through just like acknowledging that, just like really understanding that. Um, and, you know, when we started, I had a lot of other conversations with, you know, funders in the area, um, particularly one conversation I had with NIFA, with Kamaria Carrington and Kim Seto, where they were talking about how like during this time period, it is important for artists to have, um, you know, something that sustains their life. So then they can then make new projects. And so, it, and, and a lot of artists also are talking about um, how they don't want to compete with each other, how that's not the kinds of, um, you know, systems that they want to participate in anymore. And that some people are taking themselves out of those processes because they don't, they want to give to others. And so you're seeing this like incredible generosity and incredible need. Um, and I, I don't necessarily have an answer for that, but I do feel like, you know, I, I want, I want to be part of that conversation. And I want funding to be part of that conversation. And I think that's like where also, you know, this kind of idea of the solidarity economy, which is like a global movement of like, you know, kind of new economic thinking, you know, which is based on this idea of like mutual aid networks and cooperative governance. And, you know, what is what kind of infrastructures should we be supporting so that, you know, there is wealth and disinvested communities. Like that, like how do we, you know, think not about like support individuals, but support individuals within a context. So yeah, I don't, I don't know, but I see that like this sort of generosity and need is like this, you know, is so is so rich, and in in, in it, we need to, you know, kind of all step into that. Um, so I think that's that's a little bit where I'm at. Yeah, and this. Um... I want to come back and hear you speak a little bit more about sort of you all entering into the space of trust-based funding and how mm -hmm. even that's an evolution of of late. But the the concept that you named um, around you know what we call scarcity mindset, this idea that we're going to we're we're all competing for limited dollars, is actually um, oftentimes rooted in with re regard to our personal relationship with money. Um, and then how how we go about asking for it, thinking that whether or not we are worthy of, of receiving it, and that evolution that you named of, of going from six thousand dollars being a substantial grant to realizing that you that there's only so much that you can do with six thousand dollars as as a part of bigger projects and and work. But this idea that artists are not looking to compete with each other, um, it it speaks to, and I'm going to come to you in a second, Kathleen, to how you named how you know dollars aren't the only things that we can contribute to artists, to spaces, um, when we talk about resources. Um, and I, what, I've have, what I have seen in the philanthropic space on, on, on the nonprofit side is um, this concept of even bringing organizations or in your cases, artists together, right? Even if they are seeking funding, but that community, cultivating community amongst the artists, um, amongst other community resources and organizations can change the landscape in and of itself. And it may spark the next project, the next monument, um, even if the dollars are not the thing that are being contributed in that space. And so Kathleen, anything to, to add there, but I, I, I think I did hear you saying how even beyond the dollars that there are ways in which folks are, are coming together to do this work that then you know provide resources, opportunities to artists and spaces and communities. Yeah, I mean, the question is still how to put this in an application, but of course, I um, I also noticed now during the pandemic that the, um, um, let's say the ministry and the funders were very generous also in prolonging projects because of course, there is a kind of certain time delay in the projects and we see that, uh, um, yeah, that the foundations we are working with are also very much collaborating and understanding the situations uh, of these kind of uh, project realization and processes. This is something that we noted. And what we are also looking for is somehow starting, in, starting an exchange between different commissioner groups also. We are still in the pilot phase in Germany, but this exchange about this different way of working among the commissioners and maybe later also among the artists is also something that we of course 
find very interesting because we are also not working in this classical mode of competition. Um, sure, sure. Um, folks in, in our audience, I want to call you all in. I've got more questions and I'm happy to ask them, but if you have any for <laughs> Kathleen or Abby, please um, drop them in our Q&A and or drop them in the um, chat. I'm going to go with uh, the first one that is here. Um, and so from Lou, is all of this activity in these realms of funding uh, the arts an indicator that we may be moving toward revolutionizing international economy, as in the economy? Uh, that would be exciting to me, was, was Lou's comment. Um, thoughts here? Um. I don't have faith that the global economy is listening to this conversation in a way that will transform our social conditions, but I appreciate the optimism. And I would hope that, you know, I, I think it's a, I, you know, in another way, it's just like, it's a learning both ways sort of thing. You know, I mean, I think the kinds of things that I'm mentioning around, you know, solidarity economies are not related to the arts necessarily. Mm -hmm. And that I think that, we in the arts have spent a lot of time investing in high profile individuals to make broad community impact without actually listening to the communities that these projects are cited within. Yeah. So if we can think about how to undo a lot of that, um, then, you know, then we can move towards a more interesting um, and culturally accessible art world. So, you know, so I think it's, it's, yeah, we have a lot to learn. Clearly, there's a you know there's a lot in the world to be learned, but um, but I think you know we're we should be in a state of transformation, you know. So I'm I'm hopeful too. I just don't know if I feel like there's learning coming from this arena to the other. Yeah, um, that was not that was not as pessimistic as as I, I think you started to make it. <laughs> so yes, we've got we've got work to do, and there's been progress. Um, and I think we're seeing it in in other spaces um, as well. Like I said, you know, our, our work centers around um, students, and there are so many cross sector applications for, um, you know, improving quality of life for for students, both in in classrooms as well as outside of. And so the the ways in which we are pooling resources, opportunities. Um, uh, I have seen, and I, I, again, I keep saying I'm going to come back to this, um, but but the um, implementation of more trust-based funding, I think, is a strong shift that 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 will have implications on, um, as Lou put it, the economy um, <laughs> long term. But um, it's a starting point for certain. Um, and so. In the, thank you, Lou, for that, for that question. Um, in the chat here, Kathleen, it says, so, so curious about Kathleen's title, mediator, and how do our titles or job descriptions need to change as we do this work? Kathleen, I don't know if you have some insight in terms of how, how your job title came to be or, or its evolution. I mean, we always say it's mediation in the uh, process of new patrons project. We are not trained as, let's say, classical mediators. I'm trained as a curator and art historian. And uh, most of my colleagues also are working either as an artist himself or as a mediator um, or educator or art historian. And the term mediator is actually formulated already in 1990 by Francois Harris. So it has a French origin. And the idea is actually that one is um, uh, communicating between these different, uh, different perspectives of the commissioners and the artists, and then later also the wider public. So it's this um, kind of, yeah, Organizing, organizing these uh, um, encounters and uh, knowing both perspectives, but then mediation in the context of the program of the patrons. But it's a, it's a, um, and thank you, Leah, for for that question. It's it's um, it is an interesting shift. I, you know, we can talk about um, what should or should not be a part of a curator's process, but being intentional about the title. Um, and, and the role itself 
by, by, by seeking input and being connector to the different stakeholders is very different than just the title of curator. And that's not a knock against any of our uh, folks who go by the title of curator. But I, I do think that it's an added layer of intentionality in terms of the role of the curator um, as the middle person between so many different worlds and, and views and, and, and inputs. Um, so I appreciate you for it and I appreciate the, the intentionality behind it. Uh, I'm gonna sort of circle back. Folks should feel free to add additional questions. Um, but coming back to this question about um, sort of trust-based funding, um, you know, my question to, to, to both of you is sort of, you know, what questions are you asking before you commit resources to a given project? Sort of, you know, you could call it evaluation tools, you could call it, but but how how do you sort of um, gather from um, call it applicants, um, prospective mm -hmm. artists, um, you know, how you're making these determinations that that you are going to move forward on a project? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think in our application process, um, when people apply for a grant, you know, the kind of criteria questions that we have that are also on the website for folks that are interested in, uh, in applying is you know how how is this project um, thinking about experimentation uh, within the discipline um, that it's working in? Um, how what is the kind of stated impact on their community and how is that you know being represented um, via images? Is there and you know um, an intentional approach to engagement um, to publics uh, that the project is putting forward um, and yeah, I mean, that's, you know, those are those are some of the questions that we ask. And then, you know, on our jury, we have folks that are um, this year, uh, because we're in our second year of project funding, we have someone who is a previous grantee, so someone who's been through the experience, somebody who is one of the funders in the regional regranting initiative elsewhere, and then um, two folks that are artists and curators. So, you know, I think it's like trying to bring forward some kind of like intersectional set of of jurors every year um, to really think through those questions from their perspectives in different ways um, creates that kind of trust. But yeah, and so so I think that we're really looking for how is this not an individual studio practice? How is collaboration at the core of this? And then are is there some you know kind of perspective that you know needs to be seen? And then, you know, with with those questions being answered, then then those those selected projects move forward. And then I think, you know, in terms of trust, like we again, maybe it goes back to the idea that we're, you know, not it's not major impact funding. It's really about, you know, kind of like getting something moving forward. Um, but we really, yeah, don't ask at the end for that kind of, you know, impact statement. Um, but we really, we want to be brought along on the process with artists so that we can learn from them, not so that we can make them involved in our bureaucracies that are demanded through our institutions and our funding models. So, you know, it's, uh, to me, it's really about like, we, they have something to teach us. Mm -hmm. they, and 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 then we have to support them in that process and not that we are like, you know, funding with the intention that we're going to tell them how to make public art. We're going to tell them how to work in their communities. Um, and, you know, like we we're I'm you know, I'm coming from the university. I'm coming from the institution like, you know, the forms are changing. And I you know, that's that's something that I need to be open to that. I need to create a set of conditions to be open to. Um, and so one of the things we're working through is we're going to try and form a community council to kind of help us with all of those things, like an advisory group, because, uh, you know, we're at the university and we're like we are starting at not being accessible. We're starting at not being connected because of the barriers of higher education, not in particular because of us in particular. Um, so, yeah, those are all the kinds of things that I'm trying to work through and sort of saying I'm in I'm into trust based funding, you know, going into our second uh, round. Um, so, yeah, that's great. Thanks, Abby. Katrin. Um, yeah, we are at the moment in this kind of transition phase where we are also thinking about like um, in kind of new organization of mediators, like how to finance ourselves and then also the um, requested projects. Um, 
And uh, I think what is really er important for us is always the first, um, a a first uh, encounter and get to know these kind of questions of urgency and yeah, the willingness to be become uh, yeah um, engaged in such a process because in the beginning we always not so much talk about a specific artistic idea but more kind of a local question uh, a local thematic so um, yeah we are very much looking for this type of agency and this willingness to work together as a group in this kind of process or adventure as we call it and um, and uh, and uh, also try to learn uh, to find out uh, more about the context of this uh, question and uh, negotiation yeah yeah and the the um as you put it, the, the local questions and thematics that sort of arise, how, how are those sort of determined? I mean, in the beginning, it's always a very small group of uh, persons that we are uh, working with. And it's, it's, uh, it, it can be very, very different questions. It can be the question of uh, how, one want to, how one wants to become uh, old in a rural area and how to think about this question. But it can also be a question related uh, uh, to uh, thinking about uh, a situation of migration in Germany and how to communicate uh, these kind of futures one has. Uh, and um, it's, it's very much about this personal exchange and uh, finding out first uh, in, why, in which context these kind of questions are formulated. And then from there, a lot of discussions and uh, research starts usually. Excellent. And then as soon as the artists come in, it's of course a completely new perspective. And then yeah. the dialogue starts again. Sure, 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 sure. Makes perfect sense. Um, well, if there are no further questions, I'm going to ask my final question of you all. It's two part, um, so bear with me. Um, but I'll give folks another opportunity to drop something in the chat. I'm just checking. Okay, great. So um, think of this as your sort of closing statement. Um, you know, if you um, could sort of summarize um, what you what equitable funding sort of means to you and, and your thoughts on how we make it into a reality. Um, what, what say you? Oh man, how do I say, how do I say what I said in a different way <laughs> too close? Um, yeah, I, you know, I think equitable funding is, um is based in transparency it's based in community involvement um and it's based in community investment and you know if i think that as a white person coming from a institutional space my job is to you know is to think through the distribution of resources that i have access to and to really sit in a deep place of learning with the knowledge bearers in my community and to transform the conditions um, continually with them as leaders and and me as support and um, and I hope that I get to you know and so I don't know <laughs> I don't know I think that's like that's sort of part of the process for me um, and so yeah I think I just am grateful and um, and I think yeah that reality is like continuing to honor each other like to honor these perspectives and the artists that are living here and to understand the you know the ways in which this you know the ways in which we are on stolen land the way that which we can you know deeply acknowledge that the way that we can you know think about the dispossession that is continually happening in the city so we have to un we have to continually be thinking through the context in which artists and community are making their work um and in order to make equitable funding a reality um so we have to undo institutional power no big deal <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that abby Got i mean for us, it's of course also a big question mark although i have to say that it 
for us it's also really interesting to have this exchange as a bottom-up network with institutions also because this is uh, also how uh, our model is uh, thought in uh, in germany that there are institutions we are collaborating with in a way and also relying on their institutional expertise um yeah big big question mark uh, i would also say and um, um i um i would say that it's it's really really important to as a, like from a mediator perspective i would say that it's very important to have this exchange between the kind of participants applicants in this process let's say the artists other institutions and the different ones and to know these kind of different needs and perspectives yeah i um love that you um uh both lead with humility but you're both doing it you're both you're both um on the path to figuring it out um and and i appreciate you all sort of being here today and and um sharing your journeys with with our group um and sharing your truths and and it takes a lot to um you know to, to say I don't know, but again, I just want to reiterate that you all have named, dropped so many gems today in examples of the steps that folks can take and that you are steps ahead of where, where many are, have, have not even entered into. And so again, appreciate all of your contributions today. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn things over to Leah, um, who's going to yes. close this out. So thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Abby, Katrine, Devin, thank you so much for, for being part of this. Thank you all for, for coming and spending this time with us. Um, I think there's a lot of question marks and we are in a moment of transformation, but I think transparent and open conversations like this um, is how we move the dial um, to more accessibility and equitability around funding. Um, so thank you all for, for bringing, bringing so much. Um, I also wanna thank NIFA for their support of their pro program. They were mentioned um, in our, our discussion. Um, we dropped a link in there. Um, and I also do wanna put in another plug for Collective Futures Fund. Those applications, if you're in the greater Boston based area are due next week, June 30th. So get those in. Um, otherwise, I hope um, if you're in if you're in Boston in July, um, July 18th through August 18th, um, come visit us down at um, Somersets with Jill and the Faneuil Hall. Um, and again, thank you so much to our panelists, to the Goethe Institute, um, and for you all for being here. And have a good rest of your day. <laughs>